our story continues. Odysseus rode a changed man. Never in his life had he considered himself a champion of the people, a transformer of a world. He had been content simply being a farmer, tilling the soil, raising the crops and seeing to his animals. How short-sighted and simple it all seemed now. Odysseus no longer questioned the change in his behavior, no more than he questioned the swelling of power within him. He was thankful to Lilia, not just for her experience, but her guidance and understanding. She knew that yearning of the masses to no longer be subject to the mercurial machinations of the mage clans or corrupt sects such as the Triune or the Cathedral is what people needed. He felt that with her, anything was possible. The plan was simple. Ride into the city, seek a place in the great public square where many would-be prophets came to preach. However, as many looked upon them as fools and madmen, matters would be different for Odysseus. He could show them, show the people the path, the gift that he offered. Once people saw, it would spread like wildfire. He knew that his younger brother, however, was the only one who didn't fully appreciate what he intended. He had been hesitant from the beginning, bringing up suggestions and reasons for caution. But Lilia had countered those concerns with reasons of her own. He loved his brother, but if Mendeln continued to fail to see things as they should be, he would have to deal with him somehow. It would not look good for his own blood to seem less than an absolute believer in what he was doing and... Odysseus paused for a moment and grimaced. What were these thoughts? His brother meant everything to him. Only Mendeln, his brother, kept him from losing his mind when the rest of their family perished. Feelings of shame swelled within Odysseus. He could not imagine a life without his brother. Mendeln will come to understand in time, he thought. As they continued on their journey, Achilleos often went ahead to scout the way, something that Odysseus felt unnecessary considering his power, but he did not argue against it. The archer did not return until the party had made camp bringing with him a pair of good-sized hares for food. I sighted smoke, far off in the distance, just before sunset. A town, maybe. Achilleos had stated. Perhaps, somewhere where we could get some good ale. He added, with a smile. Mendeln closed his eyes for a moment, and then said, Partha, I think. That there's a town in this region called Partha. A good-sized place. Odysseus asked, with growing interest. Larger than Tullesum, I believe, yes. It's on a direct route between the great city and the largest seaports. Partha sounded ideal to Odysseus. It occurred to him that it might be best to test himself on a simpler place than Kajan first. So far, despite the fact that each night Odysseus tried to show them, only he and Lilia seemed able to draw upon whatever lay within them. Serendia appeared close to making the leap, but something held her back. As for Achilleos, he felt content with his skills as a hunter. Mendeln, however, seemed farthest of all from realizing his own abilities. Odysseus couldn't understand why, having assumed that his brother would most likely be the most adept other than himself. Lilia had mentioned one night that perhaps it was Achilleos and Mendeln's own personalities that held them back. Partha. Odysseus wondered aloud. Lilia leaned close, then almost nuzzling his ear. We should really continue straight to the city. The sooner the greatest number of people can hear you and see you, the sooner the transformation of the world can begin. Yes, you're right, Odysseus responded, immediately seeing her point and wondering why he had even bothered thinking of a tiny, insignificant place like Partha. Straight to the city, that's best. Odysseus, however, still felt that he needed to test himself somehow. He finally rose from Lilia's grip. Sari, would you come with me? Of course, of course. Odysseus? Interjected Lilia. I won't be long. Odysseus guided Cerinthia deeper into the forest until the light of the campfire could no longer be seen. Odysseus considered his words carefully before finally saying, I'm sorry about Cyrus, Sari. So very sorry. Odysseus, I... 
Sari, he may have died because of me and she pulled away from him. No. No, Odysseus. I've thought about it a lot while we've been traveling. Perhaps... Perhaps the storm came from you. I still don't know. But you never meant to harm. Brother Michaelius was condemning you as a heretic. If you somehow caused the storm, then it was because he forced it on you. You were only defending yourself. Odysseus felt tremendous relief wash over him. He had worried inside about how the traitor's death had affected her. Sari, even thinking that, why didn't you return home instead of following me into the unknown? Your brothers, they'll fear for you and- I am old enough to find my way in the world, she said defiantly. Thale and the rest will know what I did, and they'll leave me to my own actions, as always. All right, I had to ask. I had to know. I won't say any more, but I must say something. If you permit. You don't need my permission. Odysseus, I understand what you do, and believe wholeheartedly in it. But perhaps Mendon's concern has some merit. I know Lilia says to ride straight to the city, but... Is this about Lilia, Sari? No, I mean, Odysseus, I've spoken with missionaries from both the temple and the cathedral, and not all of them are like Brother Michaelius. I do think that there's some good in them. Hardly, he said in a stone-faced manner. It's just that I know Lilia has experienced far more than us, but not everything she says is what we should do. I listen to Lilia just as much as I listen to all of you. It just happens that her advice has made the most sense to me more often. More like all the time. Enough, he said feeling an unreasonable anger rise within him, but managing to smother it. After a short pause, he continued, Sari, you said you believe in what I've become, right? Cerinthia nodded. I know that what's been awakened in me is trying to stir within you too, but so far, it's not been able. I've tried. I know. Let me try to help guide it to awakening. Take my hands. If this works, it will better help me understand how to show others once we reach Kajan. But what are we... Oh. Lilia had suggested that it was their closeness that had stirred the latent force within her. Obviously, Odysseus could not share in the same manner with Cerinthia, but he could try to come as close as possible. He focused and tried to see into her heart, into her soul. He tried to let the power flow from him into her, igniting the flame. A warmth entered his hands, a warmth that seemed to feel spreading from his companion. Cerinthia in turn began to breathe rapidly, and her eyes now looked up to the point to where he only saw whites. Suddenly, he felt a force similar to the one that lurked within himself, and he could feel that it came from Cerinthia. It was slight in comparison, but the more he reached, the stronger and more awake it became. He was in awe by his own success. Lilia had been right once again. Suddenly, without warning, Cerinthia began to quiver uncontrollably. The whites were still the only thing visible in her eyes, and she let out a small moan. Odysseus released her hands, and the traitor's daughter fell toward him. It felt like... it... it feels like... I know. Cerinthia suddenly stiffened. She pulled away from Odysseus and began rushing toward the camp. Odysseus stood there, baffled, as Cerinthia vanished among the trees and shadows. When he returned to the camp, he began to ask Mandeln, but Mandeln motioned toward his right, where Cerinthia was, half obscured by the dark. She had one of the blankets which were procured from the cathedral saddlebags around her and faced away from the camp. He began to step toward her, only to have Lilia gently take his arm. It would be best to leave her be, she whispered. In the morning, Cerinthia acted as if nothing had happened, yet Odysseus with his own powers could sense that the force within her had grown stronger. He decided to let her choose when to accept the gift, but at least now he knew he would be able to guide others toward the same direction, and with practice and effort, surely 
it would be quicker and easier. They rode under an overcast sky. Odyssean wondered if he willed it if it would clear, but decided it was best to not announce himself or draw unwanted attention. Despite the continuous gloom, however, it did not rain, and so, once more, they made good time. As they drew closer to Kajan, roughly three to four days out, they finally began to cross paths with other travelers. Odysseus, not wanting to reveal his mission just yet, decided to ask one traveler for news regarding the state of affairs in the legendary city. The mage clans have a truce going on at the moment, aye. It'll last, as well as the others, which is to say, not long at all, possibly even over already. The nobles, they watch and wait while they plot their own advantage, and the clans let them keep some control over the city functions. So they can free up themselves and figure out how to get around the truce. <laughs> so one might say it's all pretty much as always in Kajan, stated one of the travelers. They settled for the night on a bank near the Sedate River, coursing along the region where the line between woods and jungle began to blur. For the first time, Odyssean began to realize just how small the forest region was. In comparison to the great jungles which were said to have covered much of the realm, he had even heard talk from some of the traders that had paused in Sarum, saying that the jungles were gradually swallowing up all else. Obviously that couldn't be true, but Odyssean could not help but wonder just a little. He had hoped that the day's ride would have lessened the tension between him and Cerinthia, but yet again, the raven-haired woman found reason to be away from him. It is best to let her work it out for herself, Lilia whispered to him. She will come to accept matters. You will see. As they neared the city, Odysseus admitted to Lilia that his nerves had begun to act up, and she suggested that they retire early and let the others see to things. You must be at your peak come the day we enter. Go, sleep. When there is food ready, I will bring it to you. She kissed him and departed. He immediately followed her good advice. The ground was soft and warmer than previous nights. A short nap was indeed the right thing for him. Lilia knew best, he thought. He couldn't imagine a future without her. It was as if Odysseus had always known her. And with those thoughts, he drifted off to sleep. Cerinthia was struggling to come to grips with her emotions. She believed in the goodness of what Odysseus had become, enough to not fault him for her father's terrible fate, but at the same time, she was unable to separate him from what he had once been, a man whom she loved like no other, but also a man who loved someone else. We need more wood for the fire. Mendeln commented. I'll go gather it. You make certain the fire doesn't die in the meantime. Cerinthia responded, seizing the opportunity to be by herself. After she had wandered deeper into the area and had collected roughly an armful of broken branches, she felt a prickling sensation on her neck that made her glance over her shoulder. Lilia! Cerinthia noted in a startled manner. Lilia's footsteps were as quiet as a cat's. Forgive me. I did not mean to scare you. What? What are you doing out here? I don't need any help with the wood. I wanted to speak with you. That was all. Speak with me. There is no need. I... Lilia moved closer. But there is every need, dear Cerinthia. Every need. As she stared deep into her eyes, she set a soft hand on her arm. You are special to Odysseus, and thus special to me. I want all his friends to be comfortable around me. I want you to think of me not just as his love, his future mate, but as your friend as well. If Lilia had expected her words to comfort Cerinthia, they had the opposite effect. As an unreasoning distress filled Cerinthia, and words like love and mate rang in her head repeatedly, she was filled with shame, knowing that Lilia had known just how jealous she had been. Swirling with emotion, eyes tearing, she whirled away from Lilia's grip, the kindling falling from her arms, and she just ran. 
She didn't care the direction in which she ran. All that mattered was being away from everyone who knew what she had been feeling or thinking. Trees and limbs snagged at her clothing. She stumbled and fell over once across an upward route, but none of these impediments caused her to pause. Her mind was clouded with wild emotion, and thus she continued to run. A silhouetted form stepped out in front of her, but she paid it no mind, and she kept moving. But only when it seized her in a grip of steel did she finally start coming back to reality. She tried to scream, but a gauntleted hand quickly smothered her cries. She attempted to free herself, but another figure came from behind and secured her. Be silent, girl, or else you must be punished, hissed a hooded figure in black armor, almost ghost-like. Cerinthia began to notice numerous other figures with hoods and armor. At first, she mistook them for Inquisitor guards, but as the moonlight showed on their breastplates and glittered across, it revealed a familiar triangle, the symbol of the Triune. Cerinthia began to try and explain things, but a swift and painful slap found her from one of the temple acolytes. Brother Rondo, have care with the child. The voice was low and smooth. Its kind tone reminded Cerinthia of her father. A dark figure atop a monstrously large stallion rode up to the two men holding Cerinthia. As he dismounted, they released her and fell to one knee. Cerinthia felt a compulsion to follow their example. Forgive me, Eminence. Your enthusiasm is commendable. Your tact in need of work, brother. He touched Rondo on the head, then turned his attention to Cerinthia. My child, shiver not so at my coming. I am friend, not fear. I am Malik, high priest of the Order of Mephis and- Of the Temple of the Triune. Cerinthia finished somewhat breathlessly. Instinctively, she bowed her head. A believer? How delightful. He reached out his hand, which after a moment of hesitation, she took and rose from her kneeling. And I do apologize for the zealousness of Brother Rondo here. We're all eager to conclude our quest. His last words set Cerinthia on edge. She instantly recalled everything that had happened in the village and how quickly the cathedral had condemned Odysseus without hearing his side. Somehow, Malik must have read her reaction for the high priest cocked his head and remarked, But come, my child, I told you, I am a friend. I sense your withdrawal, and I sense also that you are not the one we seek. There is a spark of something within you, but it is too weak. Without meaning to, Cerinthia blurted, Uldissian. Uldissian? Is that his name? And you think him the one we seek? Cerinthia clamped her mouth shut. Brother Rondo stirred from his position, but Malik waved him down again. The high priest leaned forward until his face, and especially his eyes, filled Cerinthia's view. You are fearful, but why? Unless... He smiled wildly, revealing perfect teeth. Ah, uh, the cathedral. It surely must be. Inquisitors, no doubt. Cerinthia remained quiet, but wondered at his excellent guesswork, and if perhaps he could read her thoughts. The cathedral. Small wonder you show such distrust. Brother Rondo, was there not news from one of our messengers of the deaths? of not only one of our own, but also a servant of the cathedral as well? Yes, your eminence. In the village of Sarah, it was said, the murder of our missionary was especially brutal. Malik waved him to silence once again. And the cathedral did condemn your Odyssean, did they not? Yes. She finally responded as some of her distrust began to fade away typical of their ways. If they cannot fathom something, they must be rid of it. Woe betide the day that the prophet began preaching his blasphemies. The high priest stepped next to Cerinthia, his arm wrapping around her shoulder in a comforting manner. But we are not the cathedral child. The temple of the triune has always preached a peaceful resolution to matters. You understand that? 
Good. I would not have you believing that we come to do as they did. Rather, we are here to do just the opposite, and surely it must be a sign for both you and I that we should meet on this fortuitous moment. You can lead me to your Uldissian, and then all of our problems will be over. But I... Sorinthia found it hard to think. Her mind felt muddled as when Lilia spoke to her. She remembered fragments and still recalled some things. Uldissian wanted to go to the city, and he certainly wanted nothing to do with the sex. No, I can't. Uldissian wouldn't want me to. Malik's body tensed slightly. Serinthia felt his arm slide back and rest near the back of her skull. She began to feel a painful force there and tried to cry out, but nothing worked. It was as if she was a prisoner in an immobile shell. A shame you would not listen to reason, child, he remarked in a voice no longer comforting. But you will still lead us to your Odyssean, to your mounts. Hurry! He gestured as the men rushed to their beasts. He led Serinthia to his own. Something about the beast put Serinthia ill at ease. As they both began moving forward, Malik whispered in her ear, Now, my child, show me the way. Serinthia's left hand rose, pointing unerringly in the direction of the camp. Very good, very good. Now, be sure to smile when you see your friend. I would hate to make him feel uneasy." The corners of her mouth rose slightly, and Malik chuckled quietly as they continued forward. 